Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Stuart Russell. He is Professor of Computer Science at the, Calif the University of California, Berkeley, where he also holds the Smith Zade Chair in Engineering. Dr. Russell is co-author of the most popular textbook in the field of artificial intelligence, Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach, used in more than 1,400 universities in 128 countries. And his most recent book is Human Compatible, Artificial Intelligence and the Problem of Control. So Dr. Russell, it's a real honor to have you on the show. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you, it's nice to be here. Okay, great. So uh, I will start with the basic question. Is there agreement in the field of artificial intelligence about what is intelligence? I mean, is there one single definition that everyone agrees on, or does it vary from researcher to researcher? Uh, so that's a good question. I think um, if you scratch beneath the surface, you will find uh, actually quite a lot of agreement that uh, intelligence is the ability to choose the right thing to do. Uh, which means the action that is likely to achieve one's objectives. Uh, so that definition has, you know, that's the one on which the textbook that you mentioned is based. Um, and it underlies all of the different technical subfields of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, but when you ask people what's, you know, what is the goal of AI or how will we know when we've achieved it or um, what's the connection to human intelligence? Uh, you get different answers then. Um, you know, some people just want to build useful devices. Some people really want to understand intelligence as, a, as an abstract property um, that happens to apply to humans, but could apply to machines as well. Um, and uh, so you get, a, you get a different range of opinions when you ask these more broad questions. But I think on the core question within the field of what it is we're trying to do, I think it, there's agreement. Mm -hmm. And what would be human level AI? I mean, and are we close to achieve it or not? But I, I mean, the focus of my question is what, what would it be like? Would it resemble humans in any sense? Or would it be something at the level of intelligence that we have, but different in some aspects? Uh, it would almost certainly be different, very different, because uh, just to give one example, right? The, the listener may think of themselves as intelligent and, and I could give them a book and they could read it in um, you know, two, three days if they concentrated hard. Um, but with a machine that was capable of human level intelligence, uh, that machine could probably read every book the human race has ever written before lunch. Um, and so that would give you a sense of how different uh, AI systems are going to be. So they would uh, reach the human level you know, across the board, but there would be many areas where their capabilities would be just so much greater um, than those of human beings, mainly to do with scale and speed. Um, the, other, the other question is, it's, it's pretty unlikely that machines would stay at around human level intelligence for very long um, because um, they would, if they had that level of intelligence, which includes you know, people who do AI research uh, and design computers, um, they will be able to explore so many possible designs for computers using new kinds of physics and uh, new sorts of arrangements of devices. Um, they would be able to innovate more rapidly than we can uh, in the physical design of computers and the design of algorithms and learning methods and so on. So it's very likely that they would accelerate past the human level pretty quickly. So what we mean by human level is really about generality. Right, the idea that pretty much any task that you could give to any human being uh, or a group of human beings, um, the AI system would be able to do at least as well, if not better. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, another question that I have is, should we already worry about AI and the impact it's having on our lives or should we only start worrying when we achieve human level AI? Because I mean, I guess that when we talk about an existential threat posed by AI, sometimes we anthropomorphize things a little bit and think that uh, it will only be dangerous when we have something like we see in movies like Terminator or something like that. Yeah, and I, I think that the, uh, the media have done us uh, a disfavor. They have always put Terminator robots in every article uh, about this question. And that really convinces people, not that it's a real threat, but it's a fictional threat, that it's only something that happens in science fiction. Um, and I think it also convinces people that the thing we need to worry about is machines becoming conscious by themselves. And once they become conscious, then you know, all bets are off and they could do anything they want. And before they're conscious, they couldn't do that. But you know, of course, if you, if you think about the program, right? It's the C++ or the Python code that's running inside the computer, right? There's no conscious, non-conscious distinction. The, the C++ continues to run as C++ even if you think the machine is conscious, it doesn't change the way the program operates. So the question, the issue that we're concerned about is, is competence, right? Because it's competence that gives us our ability to rule the world, right? I mean, do the orangutans and the blue whales worry about us because we're conscious? No, they worry about us because we're competent, right? Because we can make explosive devices and blow them up. We can put them in cages and, uh, and destroy their habitat with bulldozers. And that's why they worry about us. So the same issue um, is, is there when we think about the threat from AI systems, that their competence um, would uh, give them power over us. And so that's the question. And this question has been there since the very beginning of the field. So Alan Turing said, um, that we would have to expect the machines to take control, period. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to figure out how we avoid that. Um, because it's, uh, it, it seems, at least you know, in his analysis, uh, it's an inevitable consequence of making machines that are more capable than human beings. Uh, but I do want to mention something else that you, you asked for. Do we need to worry about AI now? Yeah. Um, and the answer is also yes, for different reasons, um, but related reasons. So if you, if you think about uh, the transition that's happened from, of AI algorithms being in the lab, you know, and playing chess and uh, stacking little blocks on top of each other, uh, all of a sudden in the last decade or so, they moved out of the lab into the real world. And the place I think they're having the most impact is in social media. Uh, the information ecosystem of the world. And those algorithms have more control over what people see and watch than Stalin or Hitler or uh, the North Korean dictators. Um, they control what billions of people spend hours every day seeing and reading and watching. And um, uh, so it's inevitable that they're going to have a big impact. And the way they operate uh, is manipulative by design. They manipulate us in order to change us into people who are more predictable uh, in our taste, because the more predictable they are, the, we are, the easier it is to monetize us. Mm -hmm. um, so those kinds of global impacts are already happening, even though the algorithms themselves are very simple, um, but they're just deployed on a massive scale. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned social media. Are there any other instances where we already apply AI systems that we should worry about in terms of the impact that it could have on our lives or something that could come about in the near future? I think you have to look carefully at, at every instance where uh, particularly learning algorithms are deployed in, in the real world. Um, so for example, in, uh, in hiring, so just 
recruiting people. Uh, this is becoming an increasingly automated process in both directions, right? So people, people write a CV and then, you know, some, uh, some algorithm sends it off to, to two and a half thousand employers uh, who have advertised jobs that have some overlap with, with your CV. And then the employers process the millions of CVs that they receive through algorithms to filter out the ones that they're, that are not interested in. And then they interview some small number of people. And so those algorithms have a lot of power over the process of employment, which is obviously really important to people. And, um, you know, Amazon recently found that their algorithm uh, would downgrade anyone who had the word woman in their CV. So if you were a member of the women's lacrosse team or you were uh, attended a, you know, a women's, uh, a women's uh, uh, college or um, you know, so, you know, a, a, a women's choir or something like that, you, know, you, you would fail to be interviewed. And they, they hadn't done that deliberately, but that was how the learning algorithm turned out after being trained on a bunch of data. So it probably reflected uh, just the previous tendency of the company to hire men uh, because they, they were looking for technical positions and that was the kind of person they had in mind. So I think we have to be careful all over the place when you use these algorithms, what are they actually doing? And, and particularly making them black boxes. Uh, so it's a deep networks with millions of inscrutable parameters. Uh, I think it's pretty dangerous because you really don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So is it possible to program specific goals into AI systems that would be aligned with our goals, with our preferences, objectives, and so on? Because, I mean, that, that's one thing that you focus a lot, I guess, in your latest book, Human Compatible, that... Um, the goals of AI system should be aligned with ours, right? Um, so that's, that's not quite what I'm saying, actually, in the book. Uh, okay. and, and in some ways, I'm saying the opposite. Uh, so, so not that they should be unaligned, but in fact that it's impossible to align them. It's impossible to program objectives into machines such that the machine's objectives now match human objectives exactly. Um, if we could, that would be good, probably, but uh, we can't. And one reason is that um, we cannot explicate our own preferences, right? It's only really when bad stuff happens that we realize, oh, I didn't, we didn't like that, uh, you know, and I never thought that, I never thought it, it would have happened. For example, if you, um, you can look and find lists of, uh, you know, the, the things that people care about, you know, so there's Maslow's hierarchy, there's uh, various, uh, there's a whole literature on what are the values and preferences of human beings. And, you know, it has things like, um, you know, being alive, that's good. Uh, being healthy, that's good. Having enough to eat, uh, having shelter, uh, having uh, companionship, having physical safety. Uh, and then it's, you know, and a few more things but you won't find on that list the color of the sky because it doesn't occur to anybody that anyone might change it. But, you know, if you don't put the color of the sky on the list, then the AI system is free to change it in any way it wants. Right. And so that's sort of the, that's part of the point, right? That we, um, we misunderstand what it means to give an objective to a machine. Right? When we give an objective to a person, right? if you say, you know, I'd like a cup of coffee, we don't think, okay, the coffee now becomes that person's mission in life. And they don't care about anything else except getting my coffee. Right? But that's how it works with a machine. Uh, and so you have to be much more explicit with the machine. Um, and so what the book is about, actually, is how do we build machines that know that they don't know all the objectives? Right, and uh, so that means if they know that they don't know the objectives, then they're going to behave in a very different way. They're going to uh, do things like asking permission. Right, now a machine that believes it knows the objective would never ask permission because whatever action it figures out, it knows that that's the right thing to do, so it's just gonna do it, right? Whereas if, if, 
if it knows that it doesn't know some of the things you care about, then uh, it would ask permission. So for example, if, if you have a climate control machine and it's figured out some way to restore carbon dioxide levels, that's great, but the plan involves turning the oceans into sulfuric acid. And it doesn't know our preferences about the oceans. So the right thing to do is to say, is it okay if I turn the oceans into sulfuric acid? And then you can say, no, don't want that, right? Uh, and that's a, that, so this is another important part of this, this new approach to AI is that the, there's always going to be a flow of information about human preferences from humans to machines at runtime, so to speak. So what, you know, while the machine is operating and acting and trying to help us, it's also trying to learn more about our preferences so it can be more useful. Mm -hmm. And perhaps another problem we have there when we talk about human preferences is that they vary quite a lot between people, right? So, I mean, try, trying to align an AI system with our preferences, perhaps the first question we should be asking is, uh, whose preferences, right? Well, so ev everyone's preferences. It's so we, the, you don't have to align. So let me be quite clear. The machine okay. doesn't have preferences. Okay. Right? So we're not trying to get a machine that has the same preferences as people, right? So I, I like tea in the morning. I don't want my robot to like tea in the morning, right? I just want it to know that I like tea in the morning. And so I, it doesn't have preferences. I don't want it to have preferences. I want it, in fact, the only preference I want it to have is that it wants to satisfy my preferences, okay? So that's really, really important to understand. We are not putting preferences or values or anything into the machine. We're just getting machines that are good at understanding what humans want, okay? Uh, and there's 8 billion humans, no problem. We'll have 8 billion preference models, just like Facebook has billions of preference models for each individual member of Facebook. Uh, we can do that uh, in, this, uh, in this approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I asked you that question because I've had uh, a few philosophers of technology on the show and particularly when it comes to things like autonomous vehicles, they, they at least use this sort of language. They say that we have to think carefully about the moral values that we should program the AI systems with to avoid certain kinds of problems. But so is that possible? I mean, to really program moral values into AI systems? So I guess I would argue it's not necessary. Okay. Um, and it's just for this. So there, there is a sense in which it, one has to face this problem because it's, it's one thing to say, okay, I now have a pretty good predictive model of the preferences of each of the 8 billion people on earth. And so when, when by preferences, I really mean preferences about everything, like the mm -hmm. whole future. What do you, you know, if I, if I gave you future A versus future B, which future do you prefer? And, you know, um, so on for future C, future D, future E, right? Tell me what you want the future to be like. Um, the problem comes when you have to make a decision that affects more than one person. So how do you trade off? So inevitably, there's going to be a trade off between the preferences of uh, Alice and Bob, as, as we say in computer science, or there was always an A and a B, so Alice and Bob. Um, and the answer is, um, well, we don't know the answer because we've been arguing about this question for thousands of years, right? This is the whole basis of uh, utilitarianism. That's a proposal for how you make that decision is basically you add them up and you try to maximize the sum. Uh, so you try to make every, you know, the greatest uh, happiness or the greatest number, those kinds of arguments. And th those have some validity. Um, there are some tricky questions around the edges of that. Uh, so for example, what if you could take an action that changes the number of people who exist, right? Which, for example, China's one child policy, uh, basically got rid of about 500 million people. Yeah. Right. They, they never lived. So is that good or bad? 
right? Their argument for the policy was that they had gone through several famines in which millions of people died of starvation. Uh, and they felt that having their population continue to increase uh, would incur the risk of an even greater disaster. Uh, and so they felt this was the right decision, that they could have a safe and higher quality of life for a smaller number of people. Now, is that right or wrong? We don't know, right? And there's arguments on both sides and, and uh, it remains a subject of debate in moral philosophy. Um, so those kinds of questions are still unresolved, but I'm actually not convinced that, um, that those are going to play a major role in how we design AI. I still think they have to be resolved, but I think that for most decisions that AI systems have to make, these kinds of unresolved philosophical puzzles are, are, not, um, are not so crucial. So I, probably the philosophers you're talking about are to, uh, referring to the so-called trolley problems. Yes. Uh, where you know, a self-driving car has to choose between you know, killing two grannies or three small children or you know, one granny and a dog or whatever it might be. And, yeah. and those questions, they don't have good answers, but they don't occur in reality very much at all. So a, another way of putting it is if it's a moral dilemma, that means that there's good arguments on both sides, mm -hmm. which means that it can't be a catastrophe if you choose one or the other. Because if it was a catastrophe to choose one or the other, it wouldn't be a moral dilemma. We would say, oh, well, if you chose that, that would be catastrophic. So clearly we, we don't want to choose that, right? So, so what we're trying to do here is avoid catastrophe, right? Avoid the extinction of the human race, avoid losing control over the future of humanity. Uh, and so arguing about whether you should run over two grannies or you know, three children and a cat is, is probably not the central issue. <laughs> okay, so I, I don't know if this is a, a good question to put it this way or not, but uh, there are people, I've heard, for example, people that, of course, are outside of artificial intelligence research, like, for example, I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, saying that we shouldn't worry about AI taking over the world or turning against us, because since it's a piece of technology, and maybe when it comes to algorithms, it's not that straightforward, but he says that we can simply switch it off. So, I mean, th does that make sense? <laughs> well, I guess I have two answers. The first answer is Chernobyl. Uh, and the second answer is um, that uh, it, it's kind of like saying, you know, if, if you're worried about losing a game of Go to AlphaGo, then you can just play better moves. What's the, pro what's the problem? <laughs> right? Well, you know, by assumption, the machine is more intelligent than you are. And if it doesn't want to be switched off, what makes you think you're going to be able to do that? So if you watch the movie Transcendence, um, the first thing that the machine does when it acquires superintelligence is to replicate itself all over the world, right? In, in every machine that it can gain access to, it puts copies of its code or somehow uh, so that um, even if you were to destroy the, sort of the main computer, it would just be able to regenerate itself, uh, you know? And so the only, uh, I guess at this point, I can give away the story, right? So the only solution actually is to uh, turn off the electricity supply to the entire world, right? Uh, if you're willing to do that, right? So that's, that's, um, that's a hint of how it might be difficult. Um, but of course, in reality, the system would have thought of that too, and probably would very quickly have developed, you know, its own redundant power supplies and solar, uh, solar energy systems and who knows what else. So, uh, this is, it doesn't even qualify as naive in my view. Uh, it qualifies as denialism. Mm -hmm. So we've already talked a little bit about the impact that AI is already having on our lives. 
But what about replacing humans in certain occupations? Sh should we be worried about that? I mean, not just because people might lose their jobs, but also because uh, there are perhaps certain tasks, certain roles that uh, people feel that um, give meaning to their lives, let's say. Yeah, I think this is a great question and I'm, uh... I'm trying to figure out the answer to this and I'm running a series of workshops with the World Economic Forum um, where we try to get economists and AI researchers and science fiction writers to talk to each other uh, to come up with a future that actually sort of works because at the moment everyone's default future is, you know, is what is implied by your question that the vast majority of work is going to be done by machines and the vast majority of people are going to be superfluous. They won't have an economic role that is actually valued. Um, and I think there are a lot of complicated arguments um, that I don't have time to get into about the economics of this, but the simplest way of thinking about it is um, that, you know, physical labor is already largely automated and the fraction of people engaged in physical labor has dropped dramatically. But that's fine because we found mental tasks for people to do like this, for example. <laughs> um, but what happens when all the mental jobs are also automated, right? So with physical labor is gone, mental labor is gone. What's the next one? Right, hard to say. Um, so one answer, <clears throat> and I think this is an area where people do have a competitive advantage over machines, is you might call it em emotional labor or uh, interpersonal, um, interpersonal services. The things we can do for each other by virtue of the fact that we're human, which allows us to know what it's like for another person. And, and, uh, so for example, you know, even if I've never hit my thumb with a hammer, yeah. I can find out what it's like when you hit your thumb with a hammer by taking my thumb and whacking it with a hammer. And I say, oh, that's what it's like. Uh, now I understand, right? A machine can't do that at all. There is no way that a machine can find out what it's like to hit your thumb with a hammer even if it has a PhD in neuroscience, even if it does a bunch of studies with MRIs on people hitting their thumbs with hammers, it cannot because it doesn't have that, sort of, it, that uh, whatever it is that our hardware does to produce subjective experience, uh, it doesn't have it. Um, and so, you know, we can call that empathy. Um, you know, there's, there's arguments about mirror neurons and so on that we use to do some of the simulation of, of other people. But uh, the, the, that is a basic advantage that we have. And um, so I suspect that in the future, when people talk about new jobs, it's going to be these kinds of roles. And that's a very different world than the one we have now. Mm -hmm. right, right now, corporations hire people by the thousand which implies that those people are interchangeable. And it really implies that they're being hired as robots. And we've actually been doing this for thousands of years, that most people have been hired as robots to do robotic work. And uh, now, for good or ill, that time is over. Uh, so we've got to figure out the next phase. And if we don't figure out the next phase, we're going to have a very large dislocation. Uh, which won't be a very happy time. Mm -hmm. So do you think uh, or do you feel that researchers in the field of artificial intelligence are worrying enough about the possible bad consequences of developing more advanced, uh, for example, super intelligent AI systems? I'd say it's a mixed bag. I think some people definitely get it. Um, 
they may not immediately change their own research, but they are aware of and they understand the, the issues. I think some people are in denial. Um, they, and you can see that because they produce arguments that even a five-year-old could, could refute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so they say things like, uh, you know, well, electronic calculators are superhuman at arithmetic and they didn't take over the world. So there's nothing to worry about. Right? I mean, you think, really, you're a professor of artificial intelligence and you're coming up with an argument like that? I mean, you can't be serious, right? So there's a kind of cognitive denial going on where they just don't want to have to think about it because it, it's, it's a threat. They feel it as a threat to their core identity as, a, as an AI researcher. But it isn't a threat, right? It's any more than, than a physicist feels threatened by the fact that physics can destroy the world, right? That nuclear weapons could destroy the world. That's not something that is anti-physics, right? It's just saying, okay, physicists, you need to grow up because now you have this power uh, that's pretty serious, okay? And that's a result of success in physics. And the same is the same is true with AI. You know, we already have a lot of power, uh, and we're not using it very well. And we're going to have a lot more power, and we need to grow up pretty fast. So this kind of de denial, I think, is really counterproductive. Um, the other point to make is that if you think about it, um, what's the purpose of AI? Right? Is the purpose of AI to make intelligent machines? No. At least it shouldn't be. The purpose of AI should be to make, make machines that are beneficial to humans. And that's precisely what I'm arguing uh, should be the new technical foundation for the field. So um, I'm not saying stop doing AI. I'm just saying do AI uh, with the right purpose in mind, with the right goal. Um, and actually, people will be happy with the result. Uh, it's better AI than the old kind, uh, which doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. Would solutions like human enhancement or merging with the machines themselves be good to solve some of the issues you're worried about? Um, well, so those are intended, you know, if, if we continue with AI in the standard model, uh, as I call it, so the, the, the standard model being AI systems that pursue a fixed objective and therefore um, we would lose control. Uh, yeah, if we continue with that, I think that that might be our only hope would be to try to outpace them uh, through neural, uh, neural technology. Um, but I hope that won't be necessary because I hope that we will design AI systems that are beneficial rather than out of control. Um, another way of putting it is if we all, you know, if we all have to have brain surgery just to survive, then we made a mistake. So we should sort of go back and look at what that mistake was and try to fix it. Yeah. Uh, what about the impact that AI might have on governments in the future? Because, I mean, it could be the case that AI doesn't take control over the world, put, uh, let's put it that way, but uh, governments in the future could rely so much on AI that we, we would be governed by it in some way. Uh, yeah, that people would use AI to wield power. Um, I think that's a significant concern. Yeah. Um, and it starts with surveillance. The idea that you can keep track of what everybody is doing. Um, and, you know, this is not a new thing, right? Except it used to be, for example, in East Germany, they, they needed 20% of the population to keep track of what the other 80% was doing. Uh, you know, this is completely... You know, it, it, uh, unwieldy as a solution. Um, but with AI, you can do it much better 24-7 for everybody. 
uh, and then you can start to exert control. So once you know what people are doing, you can start to exert control by rewarding them for doing the things you want them to do and punishing them for doing the things you don't want them to do. Um, and that, uh, that's the beginning. Well, it's not the beginning of that. It is the end of freedom. And uh, it would be, at least to me, intolerable because it would be far more intrusive than the most intrusive dictatorship you could possibly imagine in history. Mm -hmm. Uh, should we uh, start worrying about how we should treat artificial intelligence, intelligent systems? I mean, because people, there are people that worry and philosophers again, uh, that uh, artificial intelligence systems might develop some sort of sentience or uh, have minds even. So, I mean, should we worry about that? Should we already start thinking about how we should deal with that kind of situation? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I've been watching Star Trek with one of my kids, the next generation where Commander Data is a sentient android and, and they have given him rights, although every so often they threaten to dismantle him and take his brain into pieces. Um, But fortunately, there's, in Star Trek, there's only one. Yeah. Uh, so it's not such a huge imposition to give him rights as an individual. Um, but of course, you, know, you immediately get into questions about, well, you know, if you're giving rights to software and software can replicate, I can, you know, I can make a million copies of a, of a program just by pressing a button. You know, are they all, do they all have rights? Do they all have a vote? And, You know, you get into completely nonsensical consequences. Um, so from a practical point of view, I think it would be really difficult. It would also mean that you wouldn't be able to switch off your laptop. Uh, you know, if it didn't want to be switched off, you'd have to leave it running. Um, you know, you might be sent to jail if you let the battery run down on your phone. Uh, so all kinds of weird consequences. But the other issue is we have absolutely no science of consciousness whatsoever. And people, you know, they, they bleat about this. They keep saying, oh, oh, but we know we have all this neuroscience and, and so on. But really, we have nothing but complete speculation um, or just rehashing of philosophical arguments that, that come up every 10 or 20 years for the last 100 years. Um, and we have no way of knowing whether a machine is conscious We have no proposal. We have, uh, you know, and I, I always say, if you gave me a trillion dollars to build a conscious machine, I would just give it back because I literally would not know where to start or how to find out if I had succeeded. So, um, you know, uh, theoretically it's possible that we might accidentally make a conscious machine, but we wouldn't know. And, um, nothing we can do about it. <laughs> Would the Turing test be good enough to try to understand if um, an, an AI system uh, has some sort of uh, mental life, let's say? No. No. <laughs> no, I mean, and, and Turing himself in, in another paper, not, not the 1950 paper, but another paper, he says, uh, yeah, you know, in, theory, you could pass the Turing test using a giant lookup table. Mm -hmm. Of course, it would be, you know, astronomically big. But the point is, you know, he, th he thinks that even though such a program could pass a Turing test, clearly, whatever mental life machines have, if any, the mental life of that machine, which is just a lookup table, would be very different from the mental life of a machine that's learning and reasoning and doing all the kinds of things to answer the questions. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's pretty clear that um, you can't infer the existence of mental life from external behavior. Mm -hmm. So uh, just one last topic, what would be some of the best solutions to prevent uh, the kinds of 
problems that might arise from a, uh, from advanced AI that we've been talking about? Um, so the proposal that I'm making in, in the book, Human Compatible, is yeah. that we, we change the standard model altogether. So we get rid of this idea that um, we specify a fixed objective for the machine and then the machine does its thing. So the, the, the principal idea in the new model is that the machine knows that it doesn't know what the objective is, um, but it still has the obligation, right? So, so the constitutional obligation to satisfy human preferences. It just doesn't know what they are. Um, and that seems to solve a number of problems, including uh, maintaining the ability to switch off the machine. So uh, in this case, the machine now wants to be switched off if that's something that we wish to do uh, to prevent the machine from doing something bad. The machine wants to be switched off because it doesn't want to do bad things, whatever they are, right? Um, so you get these sort of qualitatively different behaviors from machines designed with this principle. And, um, but I think there are already these negative consequences that I mentioned, uh, for example, with social media algorithms manipulating people. And this is just a consequence of, of taking a reinforcement learning algorithm and a person and sticking them together, right? Because if the reward of the reinforcement learning algorithm is a consequence of the behavior of the human being, then the reinforcement learning algorithm is going to do whatever it can to manipulate the human being into giving it more reward. Yeah. And so if it's a, you know, if it's a, an algorithm on Facebook and it, the reward is clicks, which produce advertising revenue, then the algorithm will manipulate your psychology and your, your, your opinions and your tastes uh, as much as possible to make it easy to predict what you're going to click on and what you're not going to get, click on. So it, one, one way of thinking about it is it will turn you into an extremist of some kind, whether it's an eco-terrorist or uh, a carnivore or, or a violence addict or a neo-fascist. It doesn't really matter as long as you're a very predictable person in what you're, what you're willing to click on. Um, and one answer might be ban the use of reinforcement learning algorithms in, in that kind of direct contact with humans because it's simply, you know, that's an externality, right? They're making money but they're manipulating human beings as a side effect. And, uh, and maybe we don't want that. And so just like we ban dumping mercury into the atmosphere, uh, we should, or at least we used to, uh, before the present administration, uh, we should ban um, that kind of direct manipulation of, of human psychology. And uh, you know that, that might sound like a bit of a radical suggestion right now. Uh, you know, banning an algorithm, what are you talking about? But, uh, okay, come up with a good argument to defend the manipulation of human minds for profit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I mean, talking about banning certain types of algorithms, isn't it a problem that, I mean, I'm not sure how will it be in the future, but now we are divided in countries. And, I mean, what uh, perhaps the ban could be put in place in certain countries and not in others. And I mean, if uh, by developing these sorts of algorithms and more advanced AI, one country gains some sort of, advan of advantage over the others. I mean- oh, we're, not ban we're not banning the development of the algorithms, we're banning the de deployment in a particular way. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's lots of other, in, you know, you might want to use reinforcement learning in your self-driving car and that's fine right, it improves the quality of driving. Uh, it doesn't involve direct manipulation of, of human minds. Uh, and um, I think also there are, uh, there are reasons to believe that we might see a sea change in, in the sort of global thinking on the subjugation of human beings to algorithms. And 
In the EU, we already see that. So in the EU, as you probably know, GDPR bans the use of algorithms to take decisions that have a significant legal effect on a person. So you, you shall not be subject to algorithmic decisions of that kind, period. Right? Uh, I think that's really important, this idea that that human beings have fundamental rights, including not being subjugated to algorithms. I think another fundamental right is to know whether I'm communicating with a human being or a machine. Uh, and so I think this is something that we should think of as a global fundamental human right. Uh, you know, maybe some country will defend the ability to deceive human beings and, uh, and so on, and, and again, subjugate them to algorithms in some way. But I don't, uh, I, I wouldn't want to be the person who had to make that argument in the United Nations, right? So uh, I, I think, you know, just as we have a uh, principle of physical security and it's enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think, um, I think we need to maybe uh, revisit that declaration and add some rights that humans have with respect to algorithms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just one last question. Um, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future in terms of how humans might deal with AI and the problems that can come with it? Great question. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just, in, I guess I'm naturally optimistic about things uh, and I'm constantly disappointed. Uh, so, um, but I, I, I think these problems are solvable. Politicians can certainly screw it up, but I think the problems are solvable. So I am reasonably optimistic that, uh, you know, it, it, particularly if the, the AI community uh, gets behind this, um, you know, and, I, and I'm reminded of some other communities. Um, for example, the physics community is united in its opposition to the use of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, the medical community is united in its opposition to the use of torture and um, execution. And those uh, communities have had a significant effect on governments and policies around the world. Now, they haven't, they haven't succeeded in completely abolishing those, but, um, you know, they did succeed. The biologists did succeed in abolishing biological weapons. That was an initiative that came from the biology community and was accepted at the political level. Uh, and I think the AI community has a responsibility to the world uh, to sort through the technical questions and advise governments on how to do things the right way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's end on that positive note, I guess. And Dr. Russell, just before we go, uh, are there any good places on the internet where people can find your work? Uh, you can certainly Google me or uh, use whatever other search engine you'd like, just put my name in. Uh, and all my papers are on my webpage. Um, the books, obviously, you have to buy them, uh, but those, those are widely available in, in quite a lot of languages. Um, so uh, Human Compatible is coming out, I think, in maybe a dozen languages. I'm still waiting for a French publisher. So if there's a French publisher listening or a French researcher who knows a French publisher, uh, please, get, please get them to, uh, to talk to my agent and, and get it published in French, because Fr France is one of my, is my other home. Uh, at the moment. So we, we, we love living there. We have a house in Paris and uh, we're very fond of the French. So uh, that would be nice to have a book in French. Mm -hmm. Does the book already have a Portuguese translation? I believe, yes. There's a, a company in Brazil mm -hmm. um, that's doing, I know it's not exactly the same as, as uh, Portuguese Portuguese, but it's close enough. Uh, yeah, so that should be out pretty soon. Okay, great. So I will include links to all of that in the description box of the interview so that people can check it out. And Dr. Russell, it was a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Very nice talking to you, Ricardo. 
Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with top academics and scholars from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, I also have links to that in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please leave a like, share it and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga Larsen. Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Deza Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, and Yannick Punter. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rujewski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.